Good morning, and here we are, day 25. And what I want to spend day 25 doing is getting you to understand that we need to bring together sound, vision, motor skills, and it's got to get inside the head. You actually have to be able to understand things cognitively, not just be able to do them mechanically, not just be able to talk your way through them. You've got to really understand them, that there are no coping strategies. You have to know how to break down a job and you have to know how to be able to then put it back together again and see the answer to the problem. So getting children to the skills where they have highest level of learning. So we're away. Stick with the old juggling. And what you're doing, you're bringing left and right together. Your vision has to work, your peripheral vision, your timing, which is sound processing, and your sense of proprioception. Everything comes together in juggling. That's why I love it. When you ask the child at first to do it, often they find that incredibly difficult and they're twisting their body or they are not going over their midline or whatever. So taking something like a book and getting them to throw over the book. Don't even worry about the business of catching. Just let them get over. So one mark just for getting over the midline and being able to do it from one side and the other. You want to get over the midline. Getting over the midline and catching is even better. So once you've got that idea that they've got to get over this midline, that the midline is, exists and that left and right have to come together, they get in their head how left and right work and they start being able to work with left and right. And they need to keep practicing every day until they can throw a ball from left to right in a rhythmic manner and just keep going. Really, really important. Once you've done one ball, you need to start thinking about two. So in this case, we've got a red and a blue ball, though for your purposes we haven't. And the first ball is going to get thrown. So it's first one, and one goes up to the point where it's a bit above the person's eyes. And when it reaches that point, the second one goes up and the first one comes down. So it's first one, then the other. And to get somebody to be able to throw up one ball, wait till one ball's at the top, and then throw the second one takes real sequencing skills. That's your sound processing, that ability to really think that I'm doing first one, then the other. And you want that happening so that they can delay the start of the second ball. Two balls going up at the same time is not juggling. It's not what we want. We want this sequencing. It's really important. Eventually, when you go up to three balls, you'll need to get the sequencing. And always the ball is arcing. And you want to get them to the point where they can start with either hand and their juggling with two balls is equally good. If they go on practicing, practicing, then when they move up to three balls, it is very much easier. And just understanding in their heads, just understanding the sequence of the balls, drawing pictures about what's going to happen, talking and modeling it through, seeing other people doing it slowly, practicing it in stages, first one, then the other, until they can catch both balls until they can work starting with either hand. It seems like nothing, but what we are doing is knitting together left and right. Vision, motor skills, sequencing, so that's your sound processing, your sense of proprioception, where you are in space, where two and then three balls are in space. Really important. It helps you with all sorts of other higher level skills. So when you move on from that, you might want to then do some exercise with the child, making sure their sense of left and right on themselves is perfect. And it should be, oh, you know, very quick job to do. The second thing you want is to get them directing other people and other objects. 
left and right until you are sure they can project left and right onto something else. And that is a skill that's associated with children who are seven plus. Once you've got those skills in place, so things like mapping and navigation become very much easier. Playing games like orientation, so they really know where they are in space. This is all foundation work, of course, for A-level spatial maths, for degree-level spatial maths, for engineering. Really good stuff. It's important if you're just going to play sport, because you can visualise the next series of moves. You can think spatially about where everybody is on the field. You can play at a much higher level. Jigsaw puzzles. It's a test I always do on clients. I ask them to put together a 12 piece jigsaw puzzle. And I would say it's a real clincher when people have got problems with left and right coming together. And understanding things as a whole. So when you start with small children, spend a bit of time just looking, just thinking actually a 12 piece jigsaw puzzle has 12 pieces. All but two of the pieces are edge pieces. There are four corners. There are, you know, going to be a row along the bottom, a row along the top, and then you've only got two side pieces in the middle and two middle pieces with no edge. How do I know it's an edge piece? Because an astonishingly large number of my clients do not differentiate between the edge and the middle pieces for jigsaw. So how, when I look at the shapes individually, how do I know? Really thinking just about what on earth the shape of the jigsaw might look like. And a 12 piece is going to be either four by three or three by four. It's not likely to be anything else. So I've got in my head an idea of my framework. When you lay the pieces out, the child is not going to touch them. Going to put our hands under our armpits or on our head or somewhere and we're not going to touch the pieces we are going to look at them and no one is going to touch a piece unless they're absolutely certain they can join it it's really important because what we're getting the child to do is really look at those pieces really think about them and think what's going to connect so remember we've got edge pieces we've got middle pieces we could easily start looking, where are the middle pieces? Where are the edge pieces? What is likely to be at the top? And as you look at those pieces, think to yourself, what's going to be at the top of the picture? Well, I can see blue. So that's pretty likely to be blue sky. And I can see four pieces with blue sky. So pretty confident we've got four pieces with blue sky there which are going to be the top. The bottom is probably more tricky but I can start seeing the middle pieces. I know the ones with no edge and the middle pieces. I know the ones which appear to be the side pieces. I can, I can see that. And when you're looking at it think can you actually roughly visualise how it's going to fit together as a picture? When the child thinks they can start matching pieces, you then let them, but they've got to use both hands. And you make sure they make equal use of both hands. And you're really quite strict that they're not rotating things. Go, oh, no, I've got that wrong. You put them back as they were and we go back and looking if they've got it wrong. Things have to be moved and placed. You are teaching the child to see something as a whole. And over time, they will develop the skill to do that. It's really important. So when you move on from this, I'd suggest you go to increasingly complex puzzles because it's extremely good to get somebody to see things as a whole. The puzzle has to be made as a whole. It can't be made in two halves. The child's not wriggling. They've got to sit there square using both eyes, both arms. But you keep doing puzzles and you develop a sense of whole and you move on from that to more complex puzzles 3d demanding more complex things shapeometry for instance one of my favorites all sorts of things you could be doing think about doing 
solving logistical problems and even making models of what do you think the problem is? When I'm working with people who are new to sound therapy, I tell them to make a model of the inner ear, to understand how the inner ear works. Once you do that, you start realizing how it functions. Same with children. Making things helps with understanding. Next thing I want to think about is number. Lots of children come to us, teenagers, who quite frankly don't know the number zero to 10. No grasp of it at all. Or it's all desperate counting and often getting it wrong. I think we ought to be spending most of the first three years of children's education on those 10 digits, 11 digits. If you are from the Far East, you will know about finger counting. Asians tend to finger count. It is a very useful system. Everybody within each culture tends to use the same counting system. So sticking with one counting system throughout school makes sense. But because they are working with their fingers, they've got the tactile sense. They have that very strong sense of the number 10, that 10 is our counting system. We work in what's called deanery and that we need to have a really strong understanding of 10. That's further reinforced by things like abacus. But at the beginning stage, you have to really get 10 and really understand it. And so playing with the fingers means that you are naturally working with one to 10. You are eventually going to get to the stage where you can visualize 10 really easily if your binocular vision comes in. So other things we need to do, we might get some letters and we might put the letters and numbers, we might put them in a bag or behind our backs. And the child's got to feel and tell you, oh, I think this is the number seven. And they get it out and sure enough, you've got a number seven. Once they can identify all the numbers by touch, and in order to do that, they've got to know what the number looks like, feel and match their sense of feeling and their visual picture of what the number looks like. It's actually quite sophisticated, getting them to recognize what the actual number is with the concept of the number. Once you've got them feeling one number, then put two behind their back. When they've identified the two numbers, then get them to add them. Just getting them to do things differently increases the depth of their understanding. Making as many games as possible that test every sense. Really important. Number bonds, I can't bore you to death enough. Our children don't really understand number bonds. They might have memorized them and you say seven and they say three, but actually they don't really know them when you're really trying to use them quickly and when they're trying to apply them at a higher level, not secure. So doing all sorts of games with number bonds with tactile objects, any bricks you've got, any oranges, apples, bananas, anything that's going to get you to 10 and that sense of those are our number bonds. You know, I take away two, I've got eight. I take away three, I've got seven. Really very physical understanding. And then you can play more games with them. Again, putting the blocks into a dark bag and you've got to match them until you've definitely got the numbers up to 10 in blocks. You know by feel, you know that you can visualize numbers and that things make more sense. You can play number bond snap. So just a normal set of cards, just take the numbers one to 10. As they lay the cards down, the preceding numbers, if they add up to 10, you can shout number 10 or snap. And if you've got two or three numbers starting to add up to 10, the child is really having to think, oh, what is it that makes up 10? Oh, it's a one, it's a two, oh, we've got a seven. And they can start predicting 
what number do I want to be put down in order for this to make it up to 10? And you can play the game very slowly and you've laid down one and two, you've got your ace and your two, and you can say to the group, what number are we looking for to get to 10? And then somebody might say, well, I'm looking for a seven because one, two plus a seven will get us to 10. Somebody else might say, I'm looking for an eight, two plus eight will get me to 10. That flexibility of thinking, understanding, finding there's more than one strategy to find a solution. Really important number play that we ought to be doing a lot of until we really have got 10. And I don't honestly think we should be leaving 10 in those early years. It's particularly reception, so on. I see huge numbers that make no sense. We need to start building up to the idea we're going to move beyond 10 and we want to understand 100. To understand 100, you've got to understand pattern. You've got to be able to recognize a pattern and copy a pattern. So things like tricky fingers, things like whatever this Chinese game is, wooden game, things like cubits, they are all really good games in order to get a sense of pattern. And they're very tactile. And the more tactile the development of the sense of pattern, the better. And we want to get to the point where we can see the pattern and copy the pattern using both hands. We can see the pattern and we can potentially copy the pattern from memory, which is really where we want to get to children at this age. As well as understanding pattern, we want to get children to put they can see relevant from irrelevant. So games like Dobble are really important. They're having to scan, find the matching objects. Games where you have got a long piece of text and the child is just looking for all the A's and all they have to do is cross out the A's. And that ability to see relevant from irrelevant is really important because later what we're going to be doing is seeing number pattern. And when you're dealing with 100, it helps to be able to see number pattern. So when we get to think about the 100 square, we're already seeing pattern. This is just a bigger pattern. We already see relevant from irrelevant. So we can look at the number square and we can see it goes in rows of 10. And we can talk about those rows of 10. We can see it goes in columns where it's 10 plus one or 10 plus two. And in those columns, the unit is always a two or is always a one or is always a three. But we understand the relationship. And the more time we spend on the 100 square, just understanding the basic pattern of it, the better. Because trust me, most children don't really understand the pattern of it, not when we see them. So you want them to be able to pretty much tell you what any cube on the 100 square is. That's understanding the 100 square. To be able to think, ah, oh, 33 is three blocks of 10 plus a three. 56 is five blocks of 10 plus a six really, really understanding that. And the more time we spend on it, the better, because we are investing in long-term understanding of pattern. Being able to literally find any cube, it's really important. This all precedes times tables. I don't think we ought to be getting to 100 squares and times tables and making sure we can really see pattern until at least eight, nine because we need all those other skills very well grounded. So when we get to times tables, we can see and understand and make sense of those patterns. And then we will see and understand them for life. We're not learning them parrot fashion, and we might go back to the patterns several times from you know, nine to 13 to really make sure we have a good grasp of pattern. Not one, two, 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 four, three, you know, not mindless repetition, really seeing pattern. That's real learning. 
So learning has to be in your head. Everything has to come together. The child has to be a confident learner. Seven is the start of that process, really. Tomorrow, I will tell you about what I think we ought to do in order to test children at seven. Thank you for listening, and I will see you tomorrow.